Hello, and thank you for joining Caterpillar's Safety Culture World webinar titled Culture of Correct, Developing a Worldwide Safety System. I'm Abby rhodes Fansler with Caterpillar Safety Services, and I will facilitate today's webinar event. Before we get started, a couple of brief announcements. First of all, the phone lines are muted, so please submit questions or comments for our presenters through the Q&A or the chat areas of WebEx, and we will use the final few minutes of today's presentation for Q&A. Also, this event is being recorded. A link to the recording, including the slide presentation and audio, will be posted at safety.cat.com later today. You're going to receive a follow-up email with a link to the site and an invitation to complete a brief survey. So I would encourage you to do so, please, because uh, your input helps us to improve these monthly events. And now I'm honored to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Mike Williamson is a senior consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. Mike has more than 25 years of experience in the safety profession and now works with organizations in a variety of industries to coach leaders, train supervisors, and engage employees in the development of safety culture excellence. And our co-presenter today is Brian Llewellyn, Caterpillar's Director of Global Environmental Affairs, Health, and Safety. Brian is responsible for Caterpillar's internal team of professionals who provide strategic and tactical support to more than 500 manufacturing facilities all around the world. He was recently recognized by EHS Today as one of the 50 people who most influenced EHS in 2012. And with that, I hand it over to our presenters, Mike and Brian. Thank you very much, Abby. This is Mike. And uh, today's webinar is going to be kind of a co-presentation between Mike and Brian. Brian's going to cover off the safety background of Caterpillar and how they've gotten where they are. And I'm going to cover off the cultural model. So without any further ado, we're going to switch over to Brian and go forward. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking time to share with us a little bit about our safety journey here at Caterpillar. So I thought I'd start off with just a little bit of a framework of how we manage uh, safety risk at the enterprise level. Uh, I, I am the enterprise risk owner for employee health and safety, and as such, it is, I'm expected at Caterpillar to put into place a program model to help mitigate safety risks, to reduce injuries, to try to help Caterpillar meet its 2020 goal of 0.6 RIF. And it's incumbent upon me and my team, Brian Linney, uh, who is one of the members of my team, uh, has developed a compliance model along with me to try to mitigate uh, safety risks. So we have five components of our compliance risk model. And what we start with is looking at, at the top of the wheel here, as we call it, uh, reviewing the external environment. Right now, uh, Global EHS, my team, is tracking around 18,000 different EHS regulations that are impacting our business in the 32 different countries we, we do business in. And what we try to do with that is try to identify those safety uh, rules and regulations that are being promulgated around the world that may impact our business in the future and do a little horizon scan and identify those, those uh, rules, laws, regulations that may impact our business in the future. Moving around the wheel to the right, again, we have to understand the imp internal impact. So my team, uh, through a regional model, we'll talk about that a little bit later, we have to educate our business leaders on what's coming down the pipeline in terms of rules and regulations around safety. So uh, this has got to be fairly complex, Brian. I mean, Caterpillar, large company, and many different countries, many different languages, and there's got to be a lot of different regulations as well. I, how many people do you have on the staff to help you do this? Right now, globally, uh, we have around 42 to 43 different in individuals. Some are placed in different regions, and we'll go through that model. But we have a very uh, uh, successful team here in Peoria of around 30 or so that are helping us horizon scan and look at these rules and regulations today. This is not a simple model, but uh, wow, I like the way you've got it structured so you can keep track of what's happening. So what's really, I think, more uh, important for our discussion today is we have to develop policies and procedures and controls to try to reduce injuries, to mitigate safety risks. So my team is involved with uh, setting the policies, the initiatives, the programs at the corporate level that get pulsed out to our facilities worldwide. And we'll talk more about some of those policies we put in place in the last 10 years to really get to where we are today. Also, equally important is we have to communicate and train effectively. It's, not, it's one thing to put a policy in place, 
but it's another thing to follow up with change management plans, to get out in the field at the facility levels, to educate, to train, and communicate in an effective way to implement those policies so we can protect our employees to make sure they go home safely, everyone, every day. Communication must be a, a challenge. I mean, how many countries is Caterpillar represented in worldwide? Right now, we, we do business in about 32 different countries. We don't have a manufacturing footprint in all those countries, but well beyond uh, probably 15 to 18 different countries we're doing business in right now. Uh, that's got to have a lot of different languages, and, and the cultural issues and the translation, uh, this does not look like a simple task. No, it really is a complex task, and it's really kudos to our, our global EHS team uh, to really work within different cultures, different philosophies, different languages in order to effectively implement these programs. And we have a regional model in place, and we'll get into that in, in, a, in a few slides, that really help us take from the corporate vision to a local, regional level that knows the nuances of, of cultural change and, and new, uh, cultural differences to be able to effectively implement those programs. The final element of that wheel is the assessment and audit function. So that, that is really important for us. Uh, to go out to the facilities and assess how well they're implementing our safety programs. Uh, Brian Linney and his team are able to identify gaps, places around the world where we may not be uh, effectively implementing those programs and we're still seeing high rates of injuries. So we improve our wheel. Maybe it's something wrong in our reviewing the external environment. Maybe we have a uh, deficiency in uh, internalizing the impact. Maybe we need a new policy or procedure to help, save, to help keep people safe or maybe we're not effectively communicating and training. So that's really our last control around our safety risk model. A governance structure here for Global EHS, just to put in uh, perspective how Caterpillar manages uh, safety at the enterprise level. Global EHS is right there in the middle, uh, yellow square. Uh, as the risk owner for safety enterprise-wide, I report directly to our chief ethics and compliance officer, who in turn reports directly to the audit committee of the board of directors. So in the function of being the risk owner of safety, we are one level away from the board of directors. Over to the left, the blue boxes is what I really want to hone in on. We have the Enterprise Compliance Council. We are managing 16 different risks across the enterprise, antitrust, anti-corruption, uh, employee health and safety, environmental compliance, a bunch of different risks. And each of those risk owners sit at the Compliance Council table and we meet uh, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis just to talk about risk and what we can do to help mitigate it and, and further our programs around, around risk. And then the bottom blue uh, box is the Regional Compliance Council, which is critical to, for me in implementing a, a global safety program. We have regional directors around the world in the different regions we do business in, and it's incumbent upon them to develop programs and action plans to help their facilities and their jurisdiction effectively keep their employees safe. So of these 16 global risks, uh, safety and environment, how much, uh, what percentage, what part of those 16 uh, do you have responsibility for? I have responsibility for two risks, uh, environmental compliance and also employee health and safety. And a lot of territory to be able to work through them. I've got a wonderful team that helps mitigate that risk globally. I'm and glad you're able to smile over this, Brian. So our global regional support model is structured as this. So I own the North American Regional uh, Council uh, along with Trent Dilworth and Jason Michael. They, they help out uh, in managing our safety risks at the North American region. Marcelo Vergara, uh, based in Anafagasta, Chile. He is the uh, EHS uh, director for, for safety risk for this purpose of the conversation for South America, Central America, and uh, Mexico. Mike Belson, based in Peterborough, UK. His team uh, runs the Europe, Africa, Middle East safety program and embeds our safety procedures and facilities in his jurisdiction. And then Simon Lee has Asia Pacific doing the exact same thing. And again, it's really about trying to get to the local level with our corporate policies and procedures because we need to understand their languages, we need to understand their cultures to be able to effectively implement these programs. Very impressive, thank you, Brian. So it's a little bit about our governance and our structure and our compliance model, but Caterpillar is all about results. We can do all sorts of activities, but if we don't have results, then we can't uh, take the benefit from that. So I wanted to show a little bit about how we're performing in relation to our governance structure. 
So how do we compete against the competition? It's always good for us to benchmark where we sit uh, among other companies and industries. So Caterpillar at the right, last year we came in at a 1.02 RIF, and we look across uh, the sectors in which the industries in which we work, manufacturing, construction machinery, and engine turbine manufacturing. We're three to four times better right now than the industry average, which is a great story for us to share. And against waste management and Alcoa, uh, we, are, we are doing better as well. And Alcoa is really one of those companies we've benchmarked against for the last 10 years. And kudos to, to Caterpillar and the leadership and the execution of our programs. We were able to sur surpass Alcoa last year and came in at a 1.02. There must be a reason that you're in the top 50. Uh, and you just showed us that. That's very good, Brian. Thank you. So I thought I'd share also a snapshot of where we come from the last 10 years. Uh, our story has not always been so great. And we wanted to show that we've had challenges in the past. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of resources to get to where we are today. So in 2003, we started at a, really a 6.22, which was mediocre, industry medium. And for Caterpillar, that was not good enough. And uh, really a testament to Jim Owens, our CEO, the former CEO, and, and Glenn Barton, who put the stake in the ground and said, we are going to do something different. We have to do something different to keep our, our employees safe, to make sure they go home safe every single day. And over the course of the 10 years, through different initiatives, we've gotten down to that 1.02, an 86% improvement in safety in the last 10 years. A really good story for us to share, but there's two problems with this slide. We are at 1.02 now, but we have to improve 41% more in order to get to 0.6. And we're in those law, that law of diminishing returns, where we're going to have to spend more money, more time, more effort, more resources for fewer incremental results. So low-hanging fruit's kind of gone, right? The low-hanging fruit is gone, which is a good thing, but it presents challenges for our company moving forward. So a much safer workplace than it used to be, uh, much more aware uh, employees, and now the, the struggle continues. The struggle continues. We're not satisfied with 1.02. I can guarantee you that. The other problem with this slide is the last four years, we've only seen a 13% improvement in our safety performance. So we've really hit a plateau. And we understand now that we need to do something different in order to get that step change in our safety journey towards 0.6. So again, here's the bar chart in linear form. And I wanted to show kind of the things we've been doing in, in our history in order to get down to where we are in 2012. Uh, Mike, as you know, getting to zero is there's no silver bullet, right? It's, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's a lot of hard work. It really is. And so we, you know, in 2003, we introduced what was called the Safety Strategic Implementation Plan. And that was really uh, introduced by Jim Owens and Glenn Barton to address unsafe behaviors. Those things, or uh, I'm sorry, unsafe conditions. Those things that we see, those unsafe work environments that low-hanging fruit that Mike was talking about, and trying to address those things that we can see and get those eliminated. And we did that for two years, and we got down to around a four rip. At that time, we in in introduced Vision Zero, and that was really a toolbox that our facilities used around behavior-based safety. Moving away from those unsafe work uh, conditions and now start looking at unsafe work behaviors and trying to eliminate those things that are causing injuries. And we saw another 44% drop in our RIF rates. And finally, we came in with what we call the Caterpillar production system, standardized work really around production and quality, velocity, and cost. But there's also a people aspect there around safety performance. And along with that, we introduced an ergonomic strategic implementation plan. At that time, about 52% of our injuries were soft tissue related. So we knew we needed to do something around that. And we used standard work to, again, try to eliminate unsafe work behaviors. So these three initiatives really were around att attacking conditions and behaviors and eliminating those unsafe conditions and behaviors from our workplace to get to 1.02. Okay, you focused on the presence of injuries then. Absolutely. I think uh, RIF really is looking at the presence of injuries. And we'll talk about how we're going to shift away from that uh, in our next... Uh, as uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, what we're talking about here really is the traps that are in the workplace that our people step into, uh, conditions, uh, behaviors that we've always done it that way, ergonomics that uh, 
they exist in the workplace, they're apparent, and you just got to take the traps out of the workplace. You've done an incredible job here. I appreciate that, Mike. Again, we've got a lot of work to do, and I think the, the hard work is ahead of us. But the good news is, had we done nothing since 2003, 44,000 more employees would have been injured. Those three initiatives alone have prevented 44,000 injuries. And you think about not only the employees that went home safely, but the impact is exponentially greater when you think about the friends, families, and loved ones of those employees that when they went home safe, those people were not impacted either. And that, those three initiatives, that's worth fighting for. You know, that, uh, Caterpillar has about 150,000 employees worldwide. So you're saying this is one-third of the workforce that does not go to a doctor for safety-related repairs. That's huge. It really is. And it's a real testament, again, to the leadership and to our EHS professionals in the field, all the people who, who really took the laboring oar to make sure our employees went home safe. But our work's not done. We have to continue on. And if we take our linear chart out to 2020, you see the red line here. We're going to flatline. If we do nothing else, we are confident that we're just going to flatline out around you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 area. But here's our opportunity. We know we need to do something different in order to get down to 0.6. And if we do, we're confident that we'll, we'll avoid 4,000 more injuries. And for us, that's worth fighting for. There's a real opportunity for us. Uh, so, wow, this is 44, 48,000 injuries? That's about right. Uh, that's a lot of people. Is, is there any financial impact to doing this? Absolutely, and we don't like to necessarily talk about that uh, up front, but there really is a tangible economic benefit. And in Global EHS, what we've been saying to our leaders around the world is if we execute our safety strategy correctly, it's going to give us a competitive advantage. We know roughly, I think a real conservative estimate is, each injury is around $10,000 of direct cost for workers' comp. So if you go back to our previous slide of 44,000 injuries avoided, that's $440 million of avoided cost. And our opportunity cost going into 2020 is $40 million. That's big, and that's just direct. And I, you know, the, you and the audience, the safety professional audience, recognize that for every dollar in direct, there's a significant amount of dollars in indirect. Generally runs between four and ten. Certainly it is a competitive advantage, but really what it is is protecting our employees. You think about production and engagement of our employees. I mean, there's so many intangible benefits for making sure we have safe work environments. We really do believe it's a competitive advantage for our company. Uh, and it's also uh, you're sustaining an organization. You can't lose a third of your employees and stay in business. Uh, this is this is a good story, Brian. Keep going. So what's our what's our next step change? We talked about how we're flatlining out and we know we need to do something different in order to get to where we need to be by 2020. And so what we've embarked upon is this cultural transformation project. So what makes a, di what makes a difference in safety? We believe that there are six levels of safety, and each company is in a different stage of their safety journey. And for Caterpillar, back in 2003 when we were a 6.22 RIP, we really were at level one. We were reacting. We were just blocking, blocking and tackling on compliance issues, work orders, safety investigations, and basic safety meetings, and our RIF numbers sh showed it. Then we moved on, like I said, to our safety uh, SIP, which is really trying to address those unsafe uh, uh, conditions that we could see. That was a level two of safety. So we were starting to progress our, through the levels of our journey, and we saw some incremental results. And then we moved into our uh, Vision Zero, Behavior-Based Safety Program, uh, CPS, Standardized Work, an ergonomic SIP, really around those things that we do, those behaviors that are unsafe that cause injuries. And now we're, we're through level three, and we have to move on. Time for us to go into attacking those things that we believe, trying to work on the unseen culture, safety culture at our facilities, changing hearts and minds, changing cultures and norms at each specific facility so that they start to embrace safety in a completely different and deep way. And, you know, that then uh, leads to into the, the whole cultural area. Uh, the first piece is to work on the presence of injuries, levels one, two, and three. And now four, five, and six are dealing with the unseen reality and safety uh, that leads to how do we improve this culture? 
to address those issues that still exist, but they're not apparent in the workplace. Uh, I'll do some discussion about these effective data-driven safety teams, uh, Caterpillar's approach, rapid improvement workshops, and then developing uh, a passionate leadership that just relentlessly pursues zero. And you need these six levels in place to be able to get to that point where you can have your leadership stay engaged, own it, and develop uh, that leadership across the organization. So what's our goal through this transformation project? It's to establish one sellable process. And I think it's important we underlined and bolded this because we can develop whatever next step we want, whatever initiative we want, but it has to be embraced by the company in the culture and in the way it thinks at that time. So you're not talking about selling this process to other companies. You're talking about inside your organization having it embraced, owned, and delivered. That's right. Our executive office, our officers, our GMs, our facility managers have to embrace this process. So it's got to resonate with the culture. That's right. And you can't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And we have to come up with a process that will work within the constraints of your company. And we're doing that. That process has to deliver a culture that reduces injuries with standard training that is comparable and flexible. It's not going to be a cookie cutter approach. Not one size fits all with all the different uh, facilities we have in all the different countries with different cultures and languages and beliefs. We have to be flexible in the way we administer this process. So part of it deals with manufacturing, but you also have an extensive uh, dealership uh, network out there and, and an extensive uh, customer network that this culture of safety excellence must also fit within. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, tell me about these pictures I see here. So I, I took a couple pictures of some of our uh, really uh, high-flying EHS professionals. On the left is Ashley Elwell. She is an one of our industrial hygienists. She's based in Peterborough, UK. Uh, she was at one time based in uh, Mapleton, one of our foundries here in Illinois. And on the right is Andrew Jarek, one of our environmental engineers, who is also at Mapleton. Uh, two really exceptional EHS professionals for Caterpillar. Two of the many, it sounds like. So we are uh, embarking on a fundamental change in the way we measure and think about safety. Now, we will ma maintain account accountability for RIF to the officer level. That's our expectation. Those are, those, that's the score of the game. We are a results-based company, and that is the results of our efforts at our facilities worldwide to drive safety excellence. But the transition will be below them to proactive solutions-based metrics below the, the VP level. Give the vice president something else to manage besides injury reduction. And what we've chosen to use is the safety perception survey in order to start addressing some of those issues. And the shift is away from accountability for injuries and transitioning into accountability for solutions at the facility level to keep people safe. Our shift is, and this is for us, a shift change in the way we think about safety. Caterpillar is moving away from measuring the absence of injury towards measuring the presence of safety. Now, this is a, a very good fit into, you could say, statistics. Uh, most of our supervisors have a span of control of, we'll say, 10 or 15 employees. So if they had a recordable injury and we held them accountable for a RIF of 1.0, that could be 6 to 10 years where to get to the 100 employee level that uh, it just doesn't work. And so the statistics of looking at RIF, recordable injuries, is now being changed to the statistics of looking at actions that deliver solutions. And your workforce does thousands of those. Uh, major shift and for the right reason. So we're taking a three-pronged approach in trying to drive this cultural transformation project starting with leadership first. You've got to have the appropriate and effective tone at the top. Our, our leaders have to be talking correctly about safety and looking for those things that are going to drive safe culture throughout our facilities. So how are we doing that? We, we, we're going to do a leadership roundtable for our executive office, for our chairman and the, the group presidents. We're embedding uh, safety culture excellence training through our divisions around the world. They have individualized leadership summits, and we're going to be teaching uh, our divisional leaders 
about safety and how to, to manage safety appropriately to drive the right culture. We're embedding safety training within our leadership excellence and development program. Uh, also, we're going to shift away from focusing uh, to, to focus on solutions and away from RIF. Then the second thing is we need to diagnose the problem. We're in the process right now. We've rolled out uh, pilot facilities in, that are in scope right now that have taken what are, we call our cultural assessment uh, survey to try and diagnose the problems at some of our facilities that have a little bit higher RIF than what we would expect. And so we're trying to diagnose the problem of, of culture at those facilities. And then once we know what the problem is, go in with the treatment using START training uh, and other engagement and improvement solutions to try to drive safe, safer work environments through improvement, improvement of culture. So you've worked through those first uh, three levels. The cultural diagnosis is level four, and now it's uh, supervisor training in accountability and recognition techniques. It's engaging your people in resolving the issues that are unseen. And I'd like to, to say we, we have about 30, 35 facilities in scope for our pilot project, and we're seeing fr uh, result, uh, fruits of our labors. Right now in 2013, our RIF rate currently is a 0.78. You know, uh, I work in the field with Caterpillar and with outside customers, and Brian talks about the ones that are in scope, uh, relatively higher RIF rate facilities. But what I see is uh, organizations that have very low RIFs that are saying, this cultural model is what we need. I was working with a remand facility recently in Mississippi. Their RIF for 1,500 employees is 0 0.32, and they're saying this is what we're looking for to engage to get to zero. So uh, it's not just for problem uh, facilities. It's really a culture of correct uh, across the globe. It's a great, great input on that. That's exactly right. We're definitely seeing a lot of pull from facilities outside of our pilot project right now that want this. They know it's the right way to go, regardless of what their RIF rates are. Thank you, Roberto Ortega and your staff in Corinth, Mississippi. So our key messages, I think, to give to you on what we're doing with our cultural transformation is our goal is, is still a RIF of 0.6 in 2020. Caterpillar, without a doubt, is a results-based culture, a results-based company, and that's not going to change. And again, getting back to the sellable process, working with what you've got, in order to get that step change in safety. Our current tra trajectory and the programs we have in place now will not get us to our goal, but we are confident of that. And it takes new initiatives, again, that death by a thousand cuts, to move forward in our journey to get to level six in safety. And this is our next initiative to move us forward. Pretty good, thank you, a good background. And so uh, let's take a look, this is Mike, and I'm gonna kinda cut in, and now Brian's gonna provide the uh, commentary on the side. Let's take a look at some of the models with uh, safety culture, uh, the diagnosis that uh, Brian talked about, and then uh, the solution approach level five of engaging our people. There'll be a wrap and uh, time for a Q&A, I hope. Uh, our objective, everybody safely home every day. Uh, kind of a tagline for Caterpillar, but one that's believable and is functioning. So. Why do injuries happen? Here's a, a model some of you have seen before. Incidents really a result predominantly of at-risk behaviors. There's a lot of data that goes back there, but behaviors, especially after you've removed the traps and the low-hanging fruit that Brian talked about, it's about doing things that shouldn't be done. And it's not about punishing employees for at-risk behaviors. Those things happen as a result of the attitudes, beliefs, and the ideas of the people that are doing the work also of the supervision and also of upper management. It's kind of the norm of the organization. Caterpillar's been in business for more than 100 years. There's a lot of norms and a culture that goes way back. And I think you recognize that cultures are difficult to improve. And uh, the, really the root cause is we've always done it this way. And that affects ideas, beliefs, and attitudes, and obviously behaviors as well. So. What is the culture, and what can we do about it? Because just writing traffic tickets for improper behaviors is not going to get us there. We've got to go upstream and deliver, uh, you know, as Deming talked about, you go to the upstream processes that deliver downstream results, and that upstream process is the culture. We need to error-proof that. So uh, Brian did a very good job of going through the six levels of safety. So these are kind of fundamental approaches uh, in safety. And 
we've worked through the presence of injuries, kind of level one, two, and three, and now we're going to head to the presence of safety. And accountabilities often are just, they're talked about as activities, but these activities, as Brian mentioned, must lead to a bottom line impact. In our case, the bottom line impact is people don't get injured. And so, yes, we do activities, but the activities have to deliver results. And so we're focused in on value-added results that eliminate the possibility of people being injured. Not too hard to measure this. And so uh, another one of the models, uh, again, Dan Peterson, probably one of the most famous industrial safety experts in the last 50 years, said there's sort of six criteria that deliver safety excellence. How is upper management visibly committed? How is middle management actively involved? The frontline supervision, do they have the same focus on performance and safety the way they have a focus on performance and productivity or quality? What about our hourly employees? Uh, they're the ones most at risk. And are they actively participating? Back to kind of that Deming philosophy of you pay for the body and the mind comes for free. And so this model is how you run a business. And it works for safety very well also. It's active engagement of your people in what's important to your organization. It deals with visibility, with involvement, with performance, with active participation across the organization. There's some flexibility. Brian talked about that. Things are different in different countries, in different cultures, and different manufacturing processes. One size does not fit all. It's not about regulations. It's about engaging our people in what makes a difference to eliminate the possibility of injuries. And when you do that, there's a very positive impact. Your workforce says, wow, safety is important, this makes a difference, and I'm engaged, if you do something about it. And so safety system positively perceived is our feedback loop. And what we're trying to do is find out where the issues are, and then do something about the issues by engaging our organization, upper, middle, frontline supervision, and hourly employees in resolving the issues. And so level three, that accountability piece, they know what they have to do, and they're held accountable for that, and these are delivering activities, but those activities deliver performance. It's not just quantity. It's also quality, and it's the same way we run a, a production operation or quality operation. We do activities that deliver performance, and those really are our leading safety metrics, not the number of injuries, but what we're doing to make sure that we don't have the injuries. I think to add on also, Mike, about the activities. You know, for, for Caterpillar, it really is about solutions as well. It's the results of those activities, and that uh, the way we measure our performance uh, through our, our safety systems is, is around activities, like you said, but it's also results and having solutions uh, that effectively manage safety risks. And, and we're going to get into that as we look at the rapid improvement workshops. What do they do? They measure the solutions that they are delivering. So uh, very good. Uh, from our standpoint of accountability, uh, activities that deliver solutions, uh, a simple model, define, train, measure, recognize. Define what people have to do, train them how to do it, measure how well they do it, and give them feedback. And this is how you run a production operation, and this is how you run an excellent safety organization as well. You're kind of taking a look at uh, the traditional approach, definition, kind of lagging indicators, stuff you don't want to have injuries. Now we're shifting to uh, the actions that proactively resolve and deliver solutions, not just individuals, but work groups. Our training, sure, we train compliance, uh, but we've got to go beyond compliance into uh, actions that deliver success. Uh, these are soft skills, they're leadership. Uh, they are problem solutions that deal effectively in safety. From a measurement standpoint, not just the number of accidents and injuries, but really the solutions that have been developed, uh, quality and quantity of those. In a recognition standpoint, uh, the RIF cultures recognize an adequate number of injuries. And I've kidded Brian a little bit about this, but you know, when we hit our goal, wow, there's a celebration, but the people that didn't make the goal, this is, this is not good. 
and so where we're headed to is the recognition is as frequent, it's sincere, it's motivating, it's our people have developed solutions to what could have led to injuries. Sure, we measure RIF at the vice president level, and below that, we measure solutions that deliver zero RIF. So, uh, diagnostic. Remember, this is level four. And so, uh, truly, our belief is that treatment without diagnosis is malpractice. Kind of stole that shamelessly from uh, an old guy, Socrates, a number of years ago, and it still applies today. Uh, the safety survey, safety perception survey we used, uh, developed again by Dr. Dan Peterson and his team, and over a 10-year period, they discovered that there were about 20 safety culture indicators or processes or categories that consistently showed how well people were working. Safety was, if you look on the left, beyond hazard correction, incident analysis, and inspections that are pretty typical level one and level two items. How do we involve our people? Yes, we train supervisors, but do we measure how well they work, quality of supervision? Uh, are we giving recognition for doing the job right? Uh, are we giving correction or discipline uh, to make sure that people correct issues that aren't there, solutions? Where's management credibility? You can see a very different model. Uh, there's 73 questions that map to these 20 safety culture indicators, and uh, we've translated that into many languages. We use it globally, and it gives us a baseline of where the safety culture is. And kind of an example looking at an organization, some things that we do well, some things we don't do well. Uh, there's employees, supervision, and managers. They're measured on these questions and the processes. There's differences between them. This is data that doesn't require an injury. And Brian, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, sure. I think also this how these numbers shake out, uh, it really is measuring the perception of the employees, the supervisors, and managed. Those different stratification levels of employees at a facility level, the perceptions of those safety indicators. And they, they're, there are gaps. It can identify unseen gaps in the way the different levels of management, supervisors, and shop floor employees look at these different aspects. That's an important part. You know, when the survey was originally developed, uh, all the statistics showed that the the group closest to safety reality was the hourly employees, those closest to the work. The next closest to safety reality, those supervising hourly employees, and then kind of the rest of the world. And there is a gap, and that gap means that the cultures are different, the beliefs are different, the engagement is different. And so this survey shows us not only scores and numbers, but separation between the groups and allows us to develop a culture where everyone is engaged in eliminating the possibility of injuries. And what we're finding as we roll out our transformation project, these composite scores really give us a roadmap of moving forward. What are the things we need to address to in order to positively affect safety culture? And what we're finding is many of these different safety indicators also have a positive influence on other indicators. If we work on one, we're going to see tangential benefits in other indicators as well. So there's an overlap there. Absolutely. There's definitely a codependence in these 20 different safety indicators that really give us a, a good diagnosis of the problem and effect, help us effectively treat the problem in, in the years ahead. So there's an overlap in safety. Is there an overlap into productivity and quality? Is this cultural indicator go beyond safety? Absolutely. There's a lot of studies that show that there's a, a correlation between safety, performance, and engagement. So we think that all three are tied together, even quality and the velocity in which we get out our product. It's all correlated and interdependent. So this culture survey goes way beyond just safety. Absolutely. And it goes to an enterprise that you want to sustain zero errors, zero incidents. Uh, and, you know, looking at a little bit of a drill down, here's some of the questions that map uh, to those safety culture processes. And you can see these are the ones that are the worst of the worst, the wows. And so an organization without having injury can look at some of their cultural struggles that are existing, and that would lead to, as you'll see, uh, initiatives to resolve them. We not only look at what needs to be fixed, but we also look at 
safety culture excellence. And every organization we've dealt with, inside and outside of Caterpillar, has some things they do very well. And they've developed a culture of correct for these. And so what we try and do is learn from these lessons. What have we done to have a culture where everyone believes our organization actively encourages employees to work safely, that we initiate action to correct hazards? These are things that there's really no doubt in the organization. Can we use that same approach to get the red out? So diagnostic goes way beyond just looking for what's wrong. We're looking for what's right and repackaging, re-delivering the, the culture of correct. I'd also say on this slide as well, what's, we talk about accountability for safety. Mike, Mike's been talking about safety accountability. Part of that, a large part of that, is recognizing people for doing the right things. And so we use these top 10 questions to be able to help leadership identify those people who are acting correctly and helping engage safety and safety culture and be able to recognize them in a positive way for what they're doing. So it's the coaching model. Uh, our leadership, hourly and salaried, is providing feedback, define, train, measure feedback on what's going right as well as what needs to be improved. Absolutely. And you don't have to injure people when you take a look at a survey like this that tells you what your culture realities are. Thank you. And so then let's take a look at, now that we got the data, what are we going to do about it? Uh, here, we, uh, we use a rapid improvement workshop. Uh, the first day is training people in continuous improvement teams, CIT. And that deals with how these teams function, uh, what the roles are, uh, what kind of models we use to deliver performance. Uh, you could say it's SPC, statistical process controls, but in a way it is, but in a way it's SPC, simple process controls. This is not a mathematic-based solution complex, and you'll see that in the next slide or two. We train them in those fundamentals, and then we look at the particular issues. Could be one of those processes uh, that you saw, one of those 20 processes. It could be one of those questions. It could be other things that in the organization, from a safety standpoint, near miss, not one of the processes, but these close calls, when done well, make a huge difference. And so the team, in three days, analyzes that and develops their solution complex, and then on day four, they present to a safety steering team saying, uh, here's what we got, here's where we're headed to, here's our plan for basically the next 90 days. Because after a week, we have a very good roadmap of where we're going, how we're going to get there, who's going to do what, and that leads to a presentation and feedback saying, on track, uh, make a shift, scope change, etc." And you can see kind of the keys to success uh, these are short-term. We have good facilitation, leadership, and closure. Back to what uh, Brian talked about, solutions. Uh, this is an interesting picture, Brian. Tell me about it. So this was the first ergonomic. If you remember what I said before, we've got a real emphasis right now on soft tissue injuries. This is the first uh, ergonomic RAW team ever at Caterpillar, uh, South Milwaukee. There's unionized uh, labor there. There's middle management there as well. And it was funny to, to watch. We had one of our uh, EHS professionals from Global EHS, Jessica Hardy, participate in this RIW, and she saw a great transformation in this team from having their arms crossed, wondering why they were there, feeling like they were being punished, to embracing the process because they took ownership, they had authority to make decisions, and it became theirs. And that here they're raising the roof for ergonomics at the end of their RIW. This is good. Thank you. Yes, and so the RIWs, Rapid Improvement Workshops, include hourly and salaried people. We're breaking down barriers, and we're focused in on issues that we recognize could lead to injuries, and everybody across the organization is engaged in solving the problems that they know exist, and that delivers credibility and engagement not behavior-based safety, engagement-based safety. And typically there is a picture here. This group is working on safety meetings. And uh, as you look at what we've done in the RIWs, uh, they go way beyond the 20 processes, but they are engaged with what the people at the facility say is keeping them from getting to zero. And so there are no, we're not using math, uh, POP statements, purpose, outcome, process, Complaints don't equal grievances, they equal goals. We use five whys. 
uh, Pareto work, action item matrices, uh, process flow charts, non-mathematical continuous improvement engagement tools that we train people how to do first day and then they learn how to apply those day two, three, and four, and then in the next 90 days they go out and deliver solutions, way beyond just activities, solutions. And so they learn cause and effect diagrams here, you know, a brief look at what's the effect. Our, our inspections aren't done well, and the causes, the people causes, the material causes, etc. Our hourly and salaried people learn how to do these rapid improvement workshops that focus in on delivering solutions to the problems they know exist. The complaints become goals. The goals become solutions. And that leads to an action item matrix where we have a task, a team, a time, and some comments. And so very simple to keep track of what the members of the team say need to be resolved to eliminate the possibility of injuries. Uh, and some of them are condition related. Some of them are behavior related. They're things that the survey says you need to pay attention to. And when our teams come together, goes beyond just what the survey says, goes into what their real cultural issues are, a tracking mechanism that keeps people on target to deliver solutions. And kind of an example of that, uh, safety meeting, what's the purpose? Uh, create a safety meeting process that's more productive. And what are some of the outcomes? We're going to develop activities. Uh, a training plan, a measurement plan, a recognition plan, etc. The hourly and salaried employees deliver this solution complex to the issues that they know exist. And that leads to, you could say a measurement system, but these are actions that lead to solutions at all levels of the organization. And the teams deliver that. The safety steering team makes sure that they're on target, that the scope is correct, that the engagement's are correct. And that's kind of the feedback loop that says, yeah, this is where we want to go. And that leads then to recognition based on the engagement of people resolving the issues that they know exist. And so it's not recognizing people for injuries or not injuries. It's recognizing people for engaging and delivering solutions that keep people from being injured. The thousands of things that can happen and do occur on a daily or regular basis. And so uh, the organizations choose to whatever tracking mechanism they want. Here's one that's looking at uh, OSHA recordables, uh, lost time, and costs that go with that. Brian talked a little bit about the cost. We all know that uh, Injuries lead to costs, and this group is looking way beyond just costs. They're looking at the rest of it, and so if you invest in the money to improve your safety culture, you should get a return on investment. And indeed, time and again, it shows that we do. So uh, a little wrap-up here, and looks like we should finish in time for Q&A. Uh, we have a ZIP circle, Zero Incident Performance Process. We engage people, explain to them how the safety culture approach works. You've been a part of that today. We make an assessment, the safety perception survey, that says what are the underlying issues that uh, have the culture not delivering zero. Uh, that then leads to building a plan to address those issues. And that plan then leads to developing solutions, rapid improvement workshops, that are then implemented and checked. And so if we looked at the statistical process control model, uh, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. Right. DMAIC, or plan, do, check, act. And what we're doing is we're moving safety into mainline operations excellence, a place it's needed to be. Also, this... This is very reflective of our compliance risk model, very similar to what we're doing in our, our risk at the 16 enterprise risks worldwide. So it was, a, it was a very easy fit for us because it's a continual improvement model. And again, in the check, you're assessing, right? You're doing your audits and assessments at the end to improve the process in the future, much like we were doing in, at the enterprise level. So it fit really well within our model. And so the audit, not necessarily looking at conditions, yes, it does, 
but it also looks at safety culture reality, Absolutely. the safety perception survey. And when you get to the teams, they say, yes, we're working on these questions, but we've got some other issues we want to work on as well. Uh, I use the example of near miss, but we could use preventable vehicle incidents. Uh, it, what happens is change the whole culture to focus in on what needs to be resolved to deliver zero on the job and off the job as well. And so the measurement model in the past typically has looked at statistics. This is what Brian presented at the front, RIF. And it, it benefits upper level managers, but it doesn't really deliver anything at the front line where the workers are. And they live in a, a world of activities. And these activities lead to deliverables. We could call them solutions. And, and they really, they work well at the front line, but they they don't really have any measurement at the upper level. So we're doing a blend here. And so by doing a survey or interviews or uh, questioning what the safety culture reality is, that leads to visible accountabilities and solutions that are delivered not just by the frontline people, but across the organization. These rapid improvement workshops engage people across the organization in resolving the issues that have been hidden in the past and now are not only visible, but they're actionable. And there's a process, a rapid improvement workshop, that engages people in delivering credible solutions to their own issues. And so kind of as some examples from various people out there, uh, the, the process makes a huge difference to the organizations, uh, some of which are in the audience today as we speak. Uh, here, David Watts with Atkinson Construction. Uh, major shifts, and uh, David would be glad to talk to you about it, uh, and maybe will during the Q&A. Uh, so from that standpoint then, uh, any questions you've got on Caterpillar's approach to safety excellence? Brian, uh, kind of give us a little wrap here. Yeah, sure. I was just thinking of those people on the phone that are listening to this presentation. Uh, I know that companies and dealers and those external uh, people that are listening to this presentation are all on different parts of their safety journey. And for many or some, this may seem like a daunting or overwhelming task to try to engage in this process. And I'm telling you, it's worth fighting for. And uh, it will change people's lives, it will help with performance, it will help with engagement, uh, it will help with productivity uh, and give a competitive advantage uh, for your company. And I remember when I first met with Mike and his team and, and where we were in our journey, really struggling with how we were going to implement this process, but we knew it was worth fighting for. Those 44,000 people that went home safe in the last 10 years, thinking of, of, of them and the 4,000 ahead of us that we're going to protect. It's exciting. It's something that we're, we're really engaged in, in trying to embark on that journey. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. And, you know, as you looked at the progression chart for Caterpillar, you can see that this is not the silver bullet. This is not do it today and everything is wonderful tomorrow. This is sustainable engagement and a relentless pursuit of zero. Uh, and with that, Abby, do you have any questions you'd like us to uh, address? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mike and Brian. And we do have lots of engagement going on from our participants today. Uh, so thank you very much to all of you on the line. And I hope you'll stick around to hear the uh, answers to these questions. First of all, why is the RIF goal set at point 0.6 rather than point 0.0? I'm sure there's a reason. What is the rationale that went into establishing point 0.6? Great question. So we looked at, at the time we set that goal, uh, trying to set out our Vision Zero. We looked at companies within our manufacturing facility or manufacturing sectors that we considered world class at that time, and that's what they their their RIF rate was at that time or around then. Uh, maybe we set 0.6 a little bit lower than what world class was or what we thought world class was in our manufacturing sector to try to put a blue dot out there. We know zero is achievable, and we're committed to that. But we wanted to, by 2020, be in that world-class strata for manufacturing facilities. And if you look at uh, RIF, certainly traditional, and every organization in the world measures it. Uh, and it's interesting, Brian's uh, definition of world-class, uh, basically the best out there run about 0.4 to 0.7, so 0.6. Uh, and this presentation shows you that though we're a numbers-oriented or organization, 0.6, really the answer to world-class safety 
is an organization that relentlessly pursues zero, and that's what we presented today, the approach to relentlessly pursue zero. Next question, Amy. Okay, the next question, and we got this um, in a variety of forms, uh, but several people asked, with a risk goal, is there any concern that employees would hide or not report injuries? Great question. Uh, absolutely that we have a concern that uh, at the top level, uh, we have been talking with our, our leadership that when you get to where we're at in our RIF journey, that, that that metric can start to drive the wrong behaviors. When you start looking at the absence of injuries and trying to uh, use injuries, things that you didn't intend to happen as your measurement for safety excellence, things like that can happen. We do have controls in place. Uh, through Brian Linney's group. We also have an Office of Business Practices. We have a code, worldwide code of conduct where we expect all of our uh, employees worldwide to act with integrity, teamwork, excellence, and commitment, and be truthful and uh, completely accurate with the integrity of the record keeping uh, throughout the world to us as we measure our RIF at the uh, enterprise level. But we do see pockets of resistance, and we, we have controls in place to mitigate those. But that's a great question. So, you know, uh, truly, if you're measuring injuries, uh, there is pressure not to report. And that, again, is a part of the strategy of changing to measuring solutions. The VPs uh, up the ladder have RIF responsibility. Below them, it's solution responsibility, the presence of safety. And so this is a significant shift. Yeah, with that shift, it's really trying to relieve the pressure at the facility level where all the... The, the blocking and tackling where all the warfare is going on and trying to get to safety excellence and relieve them from the pressure of, of injury reporting and the metric of RIF and really just keep, keep it at a top level. You know, with that, uh, uh, with that uh, comment, uh, you know, at the RIF level, as low as Caterpillar is, if you had one injury, basically it takes you out of the performance metrics. But if you're looking at a solution, uh, metric, you stay engaged all the way, and that's really where we want to be. Absolutely. Next question, Abby. All right. Uh, regarding recognition for performance, do you recognize both the individuals and or the group the employee works with? So uh, the recognition approach, uh, as we do our RIWs, our Rapid Improvement Workshops, they deliver activities and accountabilities that then lead to solutions. And from that then, that team decides what kind of recognition they're going to have. This is not a corporate mandate that you will have this type of recognition program because recognition in the different countries, the 30 plus countries that Caterpillar deals in, very different. And so now the rapid improvement workshops, the employees, hourly and salaried, deliver what kind of recognition system they would like. Obviously, the teams that deliver the solutions have a certain amount of recognition that comes to them. And then as the individual work cells deliver the activities that deliver solutions, there's a recognition that goes with that as well. We say and believe that recognition for positive performance is extremely important, kind of seven to one. Uh, we focus in on the positive seven times as often as we do on the correction. And the local level has to define and deliver that, and it's within their purview to do so. Okay, next question. All right. Any? I, I know we're running out of time, but we'll <laughs> keep going as long as you do, Abby. Terrific. Can you share any insights into how leadership behavior can change through the different stages and levels of safety performance? Okay, uh, what we see in the field is a, a tremendous relief uh, not to be accountable for one particular incident or injury. And that leads the upper management into believing that they like this engagement in delivering solutions because, you know, from a production or quality standpoint, they're all about solutions. And so we've shifted safety from counting what we don't want injuries into counting what we do want, solutions. And that has led to a whole different dynamic of upper-level managers. They're saying, at last, 
thank you. I am in, and you can see me visibly here because our comfort zone is delivering solutions, not counting what we don't want to have happen. It's actually made a significant cultural change that's visible in the sites we work in. I would say also from a facility management standpoint, it gives them some clarity. When they look at a RIF number, they may not know exactly why they have that RIF number. And with this new system, it, it gives them the tools to be able to work with people. Getting away from a number and start working with people in a meaningful, mindful, decisive way to try to change safety culture. So it really empowers them to make change in an appropriate way, where that with a RIF number of you know, 2.56 may need, mean nothing to them and it give, doesn't have any clarity on what they should do in the future. Okay, we've crossed the time limit, Abby, but we still got 129 people online, so if you want to give us another question, we'll take a run at it. Okay. The, uh, back to the RIF questions. Uh, the, the RIFs represented today are assumed for uh, all of Caterpillar. What sectors of CAT experience higher RIFs, and what measurable leading indicators does Caterpillar track in these higher loss arenas? Uh, so I, w I would say our more high risk or uh, injury related uh, dynamics of our company are around uh, some of our foundries have some, some challenges. Uh, we also have uh, some high risk work environments in our, our rail space as well, uh, although they are taking a, a great step forward in their, in their safety journey and they're taking a lot of accountability and, and excellence in their leadership around safety performance. Uh, in terms of leading indicators, the things we kind of the, 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 the catch all of the ones that most people use. We use some near miss reporting. We also uh, have uh, first aid injury, new injuries, uh, things like that to help us drive uh, performance. And uh, as more and more of the organization begins this and engages in this cultural journey, uh, their leading indicators become basically the solutions the teams are delivering, the rapid improvement workshops, and just kind of like recognition, they define their own leading indicators. Uh, however, from a, from a corporate standpoint, uh, very easily we can decide that we're going to have an initiative to improve a particular area. Uh, back to Brian's mentioning near miss. And so they can adjust their leading indicators to fit the initiatives that we want to focus in on to deliver solutions and performance. Uh, and it's, there's a flexibility there that the typical, these are RIF numbers, does not deliver. I would say that, now that I think more, reflect more on it, I think one of the new leading indicators we have that we've never had in our uh, quiver of arrows is the safety perception scores that we get from your cultural diagnostic that there's a composite score that comes out of that that we can use to start to measure the presence of safety and cultural awareness at the facility. We can put metrics around that to try to improve that within two or three years to try to drive uh, improvement in the cultural uh, philosophy of that facility. And you know, uh, Brian mentioned a little bit about some of the industries where uh, the risks are higher and uh, the injury rates are higher and how we're working on it. There's one other piece that go with that. Uh, you know, if you follow the news, you know that a large company like Caterpillar purchases other companies. And when we purchase other companies, and this has been my experience in other industries, you purchase a culture that's different than what yours is. And that leads to, wow, it's going to take us a while to uh, adjust our culture to deliver productivity and quality and safety. And so now our safety resources begin focusing in on cultures that haven't had enough attention to safety before and developing a culture of excellence and correct uh, in spot industries that just came on board. Next question, Abby, there's 108 nope. left, so let's make this the last question, okay? Okay, this is the last question. Are there currently incentive-based programs at the plant level to encourage ZIF, that's the zero incident performance process, which are being reviewed for standardization throughout the enterprise? So we do have, you know, some, some incentives around safety uh, performance. We try to, we try to uh, put that around uh, the presence of safety and not the absence of injury. So we do have um, recognition at the corporate level, uh, two types of recognitions. One is we have uh, actually three types of recognition. One is the HEROES Award. 
which is given by our vice president uh, of my, my division, as well as myself, to any employee who saves someone's life in or out of the workplace, and that they get a nice special uh, certificate and letter from, from uh, our, our top leadership. We also have what's called a Safety Star program. So if someone does something individually or as a team does something together to drive safety at their facilities, we have a nice letter, certificate, and pin which says People Safety First and has a safety star on it from Caterpillar, and they get to, to have that that they can wear or put in their um, uh, cubicle or office. And then we have Facility of Distinction Awards where we actually give out banners. If they have zero injuries at their facility for the year, uh, corporate uh, global EHS will uh, print and send a banner uh, naming them as a facility of distinction. We have different levels, bronze, gold, and platinum, uh, based on the years of how many years they've had gone without injuries to try to recognize them for that and, and their safety performance. Okay. Uh, Abby, thank you very much. Brian, thank you. Uh, this has been enjoyable. I like the questions, and uh, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to present to you the development and implementation of a zero incident safety culture and how Caterpillar is on that journey and uh, how we're going to get to zero. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Mike, and to Brian, and thank you to all of our participants for joining us for the call today. Our next Safety Culture World webinar will be Wednesday, September 25th at 10 a.m. Central, so please register for that at safety.cat.com webinars. Thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful day.